my pleasure to introduce Kamini Singha, who has her bachelor's in geophysics from the University of Connecticut and her PhD in hydrogeology from Stanford. She's received numerous awards for her scholarship, including two early career awards, one from NSF and the other from EEGS. And she is been, she's been laureled as an outstanding faculty member. She's an associate professor at the Colorado School of Mines, jointly appointed in two departments, both engineering and um, geological uh, sciences. And uh, her research and teaching includes flow and transport within critical zone observatories, groundwater surface water exchange, and the integration of geophysical imaging with flow and transport modeling. Kamini is also a recess co-mentor for Jacqueline Romero. And so please join me in welcoming Kamini to the UNAPCO Science Seminar. And she's going to talk to us about looking into the black box of stream riparian groundwater exchange, exploring catchment controls on flow paths. Thank you so much. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this is a, a very different audience than I often get. So I'm excited and uh, pleased by all means, hopefully, uh, if there are things that are unclear on the way and it is, is okay with you guys, you're welcome to, to yell it out. I feel very Britney Spears and very loud. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, some groundwater surface water exchange processes and, um, and also how geophysics can be used to help understand some of these systems. Um, before I get going, which might not happen because my slides aren't moving. Um, let me just acknowledge the, the people that made all this work happen. Um, what I'm going to be talking about primarily is some work that uh, was done by a PhD student named Adam Ward, who's now a faculty member at uh, Indiana, who worked with Mike Gusep and I. Mike is up at Colorado State now, while we were all at Penn State, so we've all sort of migrated elsewhere. Um, and, um, and this is really a, a lot of their work that I'll be talking about. Also, without the funding, obviously, nothing ever happens. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is groundwater exchange between streams and the surrounding aquifer. Now, um, part of the reason that you would care about this is um, that little zone uh, that's labeled hyperreic zone is actually a really cool and hot area right now in hydrology to study. Um, over the last 20 years or so, people have been spending a lot of time thinking about this hyperreic zone, or hypos, there's two Greek roots in there, uh, one meaning, hypos meaning below and rios meaning flow. The idea is it's the part of the aquifer that is below or surrounding the stream. Now what happens in that zone is that that's where water goes from being surface water in the stream, goes into being groundwater for some period of time, and then goes back into being surface water. So that's how they define that zone. Now uh, what's interesting about that is that there's really strong gradients in things like dissolved oxygen and organic matter that happen at that interface, and it's an important biogeochemical hotspot for that reason. So when we think about how streams clean up contaminants like um, metal uptake and denitrification, what's really happening is it's that little skin of an aquifer around the stream that's doing all that processing, because there's all these bacteria there that are pretty excited about being there. Um, it's also where all the thermal buffering happens for fish habitats and, th and things like that. So it's kind of a cool area to be thinking about. And part of the reason that it's important is that it just increases the amount of time that the water takes to migrate. So when you move water through a stream, it moves pretty quickly. When you move water through groundwater, it moves pretty slowly, and it gives things more time to process. Um, and so this has been called a river's liver in the past in, in publications, and that's what you can kind of think of the zone as doing, is processing a lot of the material that's there. So um, I'm going to talk a lot today about the hyperreic zone and um, the basic area of a, of a stream that's near the, the riparian area where, where plants and things are taking up water. So a number of years ago, Mike Gusev and I had put in an NSF proposal that asked some sort of you know, naive questions about what water does in watersheds, what these streams do. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to understand was how that communication between the, the surface water and the groundwater in the hyperreic zone, how that changed seasonally. You know, it's, you're going to have the same sort of processing of contaminants in the spring as you do in the summer. Um, so what does that look like? And so we had some sort of naive hypotheses shown here in this, this schematic. Um, and one of the ideas was that um, we thought that exchange characteristics of these streams might be lesser in, uh, ter in terms of times where there was high base flow. Base flow is a fancy word for groundwater coming into a stream. The idea is coming into the base of a stream, so that's where base flow comes from. And uh, in sort of the early spring after snow melt, for instance, in this area, the idea is that water tables would be high. We thought, well, maybe if water tables are high, that would sort of keep the stream from being able to communicate too much with the surrounding aquifer, and so we wouldn't have a lot of exchange. But then as the stream starts to dry up and the, the aquifers start to dry up and the water table relaxes, what we're going to have is, is less groundwater coming in, less constraints. And so we'd have more communication between the stream and the aquifer. That was a hypothesis that we put forward. And the other thing we thought was, well, it's 
you know, the amount of down valley flow, in, indicated by QDV there, uh, and the amount of cross valley flow is going to be constrained by the geology. So if I have a watershed that's really, you know, flat and low topography, then I'm going to have a lot of exchange and a lot of cross uh, gradient communication. But if it's really steep, that's not going to be the case. Kind of, kind of a simple idea. So that was one of the things that we wanted to test. Now, the problem with um, hyper studies, oh, you can see, is that most of the time when we're interested in this river's liver, we don't have a lot of ways of exploring that space. One of the reasons that hydrogeology has always been interesting to me is just that we don't have a lot of data about what's happening in the subsurface. And so what commonly happens if you're interested in, in stream systems is that you and your buddy go out there with a 55-gallon bucket of dye, you dump it in a stream, and then somewhere downstream, you measure the amount of dye as it goes by. And you'll get a curve in, in an ideal world, this concentration through time breakthrough curve, as they call it. Um, it's quite Gaussian in shape. Of that um, dye as it moves downstream and the diffusion within the stream. Now, what happens in most stream systems is we see something that looks like the red line instead. So we've got this long tail. And um, the whole stream community just calls this transient storage. They chalk all up the, the stuff that's sort of sticking around for too long and they say, oh, it's been stored for some amount of time, transient storage. And, um, and what we usually do is we fit a model to that red curve. And based on that, we say how much space that hyperreic zone takes up and how long stuff has been sticking around in it. But it's all model fit. That's usually what happens. Because the other option for exploring subsurface systems is to, to pin cushion it, right? So there's a point where you're sort of acupuncturing your, your aquifer, and you're probably not measuring what it is that you were interested in to begin with. And so um, our ability to sort of see into the subsurface has always been pretty limited. Um, so one of the things that's happening in this transient storage idea is, is this. And, um, so let's imagine we have an aquifer system, and I'm showing you like a little block of porous media right now. And if I put through a pulse of anything, dye, salt, methyl ethyl, bad stuff, um, what's going to come out down gradient is that quasi-Gaussian curve. Now, what ends up happening, or at least a model that people have for what happens both in stream systems and also in aquifer systems, is that there's sort of connected pore space and not so connected pore space. And the idea is that if we look in the connected pore space where stuff flows, we'll call that the mobile domain, stuff moves, it's mobile, um, there's a certain amount of solute that can move through that, a certain amount of stuff that can move through that pore space. But then there's a less mobile domain where stuff gets stuck for some period of time. And this is the idea of that transient storage. Stuff is getting stuck in dead-end pore space for a while. And what that means is that we kind of have two concentration histories that, we're, that are sort of happening in the subsurface. We have the part that's moving through the connected pore space, the mobile pore space, and then we've got the stuff that's stuck in that less mobile pore space. This has been a, an ongoing problem for people that study subsurface contamination for years and years. And uh, a really popular uh, field site is in uh, scenic uh, Columbus, Mississippi, on the uh, border with Alabama. And uh, there's a site there known as the Macro Dispersion Experiment Site. And for 20-some years, um, people have been doing tracer experiments there. The idea of a tracer is you're introducing something into the ground that acts as a contaminant so you can monitor its movement. And, um, and what they did is they pincushioned this aquifer, and they put in thousands of sampling points, and uh, they injected uh, a, a medium that should move with water. And what I'm showing you an image of here is a 3D cutaway isosurface plot, as uh, people who plot 3D data like to do. And, um, and what you're looking at is the movement of that tracer one year after it had been injected into the subsurface. Now, what you'll notice in the bottom image, and that's a, a plot of mass, so if you know the concentration at all of those little locations and the volume of that measurement, you can get back to mass, you'll notice that doesn't look anything like those quasi-Gaussian curves I was showing you just a second ago. And in fact, almost all of the mass is sort of sitting right about where it was injected. And there's a bit of it that sort of traveled downstream. So, some questions were opened up about this as to what happened. And you could say, well, maybe they just got really unlucky when they injected this tracer into the subsurface and it happened to sit right where um, it was injected because it just happened to be low permeability right there. Bad luck. They put it in a place where it wasn't going to move. Well, something super interesting happened in this data, which is that when they sampled the mass in, uh, that they had injected into the watershed, what they found at early time was that they had more mass than they injected based on their calculations which would be awesome if that really happened, right? I'd inject gold into the ground or something, right? But you know, clearly there's a problem here, right? So there was too much mass at early time. But at late time when they sampled, there was not enough mass. That's no problem. It's easy to lose mass on the subsurface, right? Stuff can go wherever it wants and you can't capture it anymore. But the too much mass problem was a really interesting one. So this is why people came up with this dual domain mass transfer model that I was just talking about. And the idea of this, these two domains, a mobile domain and a less mobile domain, came out of data 
like what I'm showing you uh, from that, that site in Mississippi. So the idea is, at early time, they injected this tracer into the subsurface. And what happens then is that the connected pore space is full of that, that contaminant, of that tracer. So if you imagine I stick a well in there and I sample it, and I say, oh, there's a concentration of C within that box, and then I multiply it by the size of the box, because I, I think I know that. Well, what's going to happen is that there's no mass in whole parts of that box, even though I think that there might be based on my sampling, and so my estimated mass would be too high. Because a lot of the dead end pore space is still clean. There's no tracer in it, but I don't know that because I don't think about the aquifer as having connected and less connected pore space. And then what happens at late time then is that I go in and I sample the, the mobile pore space because that's all I can sample easily with a well. And now there's no mass in there. It's totally clean. And so I think to myself, well, clean, up, clean aquifer, there's zero mass in the system. So my estimated mass is lower than what's really there because you can see there's still stuff stuck in the red zone. Um, where mass is sort of diffused into dead end pore space and is still there. So, um, so this at least helps describe potentially why there's too much mass in, in, in the system at early time. It's not that there's too much mass, it's that our mass isn't right, and the way we sample isn't right. So um, when we talk about how stuff moves in the subsurface, this is the equation that we always end up using. And um, you know, if you look at the first part of this, this looks like a diffusion equation. Um, and, uh, and then there's a little advection piece on here. So this is the, the typical equation that hydrogeologists use. And, um, and what it says is that that C there is a concentration term. And it says, well, if I was going to track concentration through time at some location, I need to know a few things. I need to know how this thing is spreading, dispersing, and how this thing is advecting, moving there with V, which is the velocity of water. The only other uh, term in there is a, a theta term, which is a, a porosity, a mobile porosity. How much storage is there in the, the aquifer for this contaminant or the solute to move? So this is the traditional equation that people have been using for years and years. This is the equation that I teach in hydrogeology classes, and this equation is wrong. It doesn't work for most of the systems that we're talking about because it doesn't describe that transient storage piece. It doesn't describe the fact that stuff gets stuck in almost every aquifer out there. And yet we're sort of limited by the fact that we've been using this equation for tens of years, and, um, and so we haven't really branched out beyond this in terms of practice. So this idea of this dual domain model I was talking about is, is very similar in terms of the mathematics. Um, in fact, if you look at the equation above and the equation below, the only difference here is that red box. And uh, all that's happening in that transient storage type model is they say, well, not only are we going to track the concentration now in the mobile pore space, but we're also going to track the concentration in the immobile, or the less mobile pore space. And uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to say, well, the amount of concentration in the immobile pore space, then, is just going to be related to whatever the difference is between the two, almost like a diffusion type process, controlled by some rate, alpha, of how quickly it moves back and forth. If alpha is really high, if alpha is a big number, then mass moves very quickly between connected and disconnected pore space. If alpha is really small, then stuff moves very slowly between connected and disconnected pore space. The problem with this model is that it's got more unknowns in the equation above. And we have enough problems just trying to find enough data to fit the original equation that's up there. So it's this sort of typical scientific problem where you've got too many unknowns and not enough data. So um, that's what got me thinking about using physical tools to sort of look at some of these problems. There's a, a paper published over 10 years ago now, but I, I, liked the, um, I liked the quote. And it said, the transient storage model, this model that we've been talking about, provides a convenient, simplified representation of hyperreic exchange. But its lack of a true physical basis causes its parameters to be difficult to predict. In other words, we've just made new equations with more parameters. And if you know if you have more parameters, it's going to fit your data better. right? And so um, you know, how do we know that these things are actually real or measurable in any sort of way? The way that the models, I was telling you, we, we fit these parameters. The way that the models work is they say, oh, the stream is a channel. It's like, a, it's like a cemented channel here. Stuff goes from in one dimension from one side to the other. And then what it might do is exchange um, into some storage zone. And that's what most of these models look like. They're pretty simple models. The problem is that we don't have very much data. We've got these tracer tests, these dive buckets that pump in the, in the stream where we poke a lot of holes in the ground. Um, but we have pretty simple conceptual models based on the fact that we just don't have any data on the subsurface. But when we take a look at real stream systems, what we find is that they're quite complex. Um, you know, if we take a look at flow pads here, what I see is that they are complicated, both in here and x and y direction. If I was going to draw flow pads here, they're short ones, they're long ones. Um, but then also in the, the z dimension, I've got flow moving through this system. So trying to capture the, the heterogeneity of the system is difficult. So um, the tool that 
uh, that I'm going to use primarily in this talk, at least, is electrical resistivity. And um, it's a really simple geophysical tool. I'm sure that um, many of you guys have seen this in the past. But the idea is that this is pretty low-tech geophysics. You drive a current off a car battery between two electrodes. And when I say electrodes, I don't mean electrodes the way geochemists think of electrodes. I mean electrodes the way geophysicists think of electrodes, which is like two pieces of rebar. And then you measure potential with a voltmeter off another two electrodes. And so if you drive a current, you measure a potential, then you can back out a subsurface of resistance, V equals IR, an old Ohm's law coming back at you. And, um, and that resistance tells you something about what's happening in the subsurface. Um, part of the reason that hydrologists care about things like resistance or the subsurface resistivity, which is an intrinsic property, is that it's related to things that hydrologists care about, porosity, how connected that porosity is, what's in the pore space. And those are all things that hydrogeologists are interested in and have a hard time getting information on. The other thing is that geophysics, um, these electrical geophysical tools aren't very smart. So when I put a well in and I sample that well, I'm going to get some uh, estimate of concentration from the water that can move easily, from the mobile domain only. The geophysics, what is immobile to, um, to flow, may still be connected in terms of the current. And so it turns out that the electrical geophysics is sensitive to the stuff that's in dead end pore space as well. So there's no difference between what's connected and what's disconnected in terms of the geophysics. So it got us thinking about the fact that if I sample from wells, I'm going to get one, one piece of data about the connected pore space. And if I use the geophysics, I'm going to get something about both connected and disconnected pore space. And that those two things independently might give me a new data set to help inform on those models. The state of the practice that you know, that most people use when they collect electrical data is they measure the bulk conductivity with the geophysics. So that's the, the property that's measured, the bulk conductivity or resistivity um, of, the, of the material. What we're interested in, though, is the fluids that are moving through these systems. So um, usually we say that there's a linear relationship between the two, and they're related through some formation factor. That thing looks like porosity raised to some tortuosity term. It's a constant for all intents and purposes here. And so I should be able to draw a straight line between those two things, meaning that if I measure bulk conductivity with my geophysics, I can back out what's happening in the fluids. So I'm going to show you a data set um, from a site in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and um, an aquifer storage recovery site where these, these processes came into play and some of these data helped inform on that process. Um, so aquifer storage recovery is a um, is the idea of, of storing subsurface water um, during times of surplus and then pulling it out during times of need. Now, um, this is commonly used in sort of arid areas and areas that, um, where water supply is, is short at times of year. And, um, but a question that exists with an aquifer storage recovery is what happens to the water when you inject it. Now, you would think to yourself, maybe why don't you just use a surface reservoir, right? But if you're in really arid areas, you're going to have huge transpiration loss, or evaporation losses. Sorry, no transpiration. And so um, you're going to inject this water into the ground instead and try to store it. There's all sorts of questions about where it moves, how the chemistry might change, what the biology is of water that's been introduced from another area. So in the schematic here, the idea is that we're going to inject water into some aquifer. We're going to store it for some period of time. And then we're going to pull it back out. Now, you can see that the idea here is that oftentimes you're, you're injecting potable water. You're injecting drinking water. But the quality of the aquifer water might not be as good. This is often used in, in coastal areas. And, uh, and so this aquifer might be brackish. And so one concern that people have is that when you inject fresh water, what happens along the edges in terms of the mixing? So do you lose water quality at the edges because suddenly this fresh water is mixing with whatever brackish water was in the aquifer to begin with? So what you don't want to do is lose the, the water quality of, of what you put in the ground. So, um, so this is the data from that site. Um, this is an emergency water supply for the town of Charleston, South Carolina. It was a hurricane water supply. So what we did is we injected fresh water into this aquifer. Now, usually you do this over sort of seasonal basis. And if you look at the y-axis here, I'm talking about something that's happening over less than 10 days. Um, turns out it's just really hard to uh, have graduate students sit out there for multiple months uh, monitoring these things. Um, but what we did is we injected fresh water into a brackish aquifer, a salty aquifer. And so what you see is a decrease in the electrical conductivity as you introduce that, um, that fresh water, which is what you would expect. Right? It's salty, it's becoming less salty. And this is measured by the geophysics. And so what happens here is we've got these four electrodes driving a current between two, measuring a potential between the other two. And then we're backing out the conductivity here in the subsurface. So this is exactly what you'd expect. You inject it, you store it, you pump it back out. 
Well, what's interesting is that when I look at the fluid data, the actual samples that we collected in the field at the same location, we see something different. And you'll notice that the difference there happens right in the storage period. Right? So what happens is I inject the fresh water, you see the conductivity drop in the fluid, and then we turn the pumps off. And when we turn the pumps off, there's a rebound in concentration that happens there that um, is not seen in the geophysical data. I think what's happening here, at least what we thought when we saw this, was maybe that, that idea of dual domain mass transfer. So what's happening here is that we have a brackish aquifer. We've introduced a bunch of fresh water. It drops the conductivity of the aquifer. But as soon as I turn the pump off, what ends up happening is that all that salty water that's trapped in the dead end pore space sort of has a chance to breathe, to diffuse back out. It's no longer being dominated by this advective signal from the pumping. And so you end up with a little bit of salty water in your fresh water. Why this is important for aquifer storage and recovery is you're no longer worried just about the edges of the bubble the edges of your fresh water getting contaminated, you're going to be contaminating your fresh water bubble from inside because there's dead end pore space sort of wherever. So this becomes a real issue for these aquifer storage recovery processes. This is indeed what's happening. The other thing that was interesting is that if you plot the bulk conductivity versus the fluid the way that we did a second ago, saying, oh, everybody uses Archie's law, is that they don't make a straight line at all. You have a hysteresis in this, in this curve. And so there's something here that's happening in terms of process that's different than what we normally think about. So here, here was the model that we came up with, is we said, oh, this looks like transient storage. So what we think is happening is at early time, you inject your fresh water, it flushes out the mobile pore space, the connected pore space. That means the fluid conductivity decreases. And the bulk conductivity is now still averaging what's mobile and what's less mobile. When you store, you turn off the pumps, fluid is no longer moving quickly, that dead end pore space can let go of some of that salty water, and so what ends up happening is that the fluid conductivity kicks up, which you saw a second ago. Nothing happens in the bulk, because as far as it's concerned, nothing's changed. It has no idea that anything is, has happened, because it's sensitive to both what's connected and what's not. And then lastly, when we recover, what ends up happening is we just pull out that salty water. We made some models to see if this could possibly be the case. And uh, these are really simple, one-dimensional um, radial models. And, um, and what we found is that one of the things that we could do from the model is we could estimate that mass transfer rate. This is a parameter that we usually fit um, from our, our, our data. And what we were able to do here is say, well, when we have geophysical data, we can actually constrain this parameter much better than we normally do. There's three panels here. The leftmost panel is the geophysical simulation. The middle one would be the fluid simulation. And then on the right is the hysteresis curve. And so what we did is we just sort of varied parameters. And so we said, oh, well, if the mass transfer rate is really high, Stuff goes back and forth really quickly between the two domains. And what you notice is that the fluid and the bulk conductivity look the same. And that curve starts to collapse towards the straight line. Well, what happens when that mass transfer rate is really high is that there's really no immobile domain anymore because stuff can move back and forth so quickly. You start going back towards classical theory. If the mass transfer rate is really low, it turns out that thing also starts collapsing towards a straight line with a different slope. Now, what's happening there is that if mass transfer is really slow between connected and disconnected pore space, it may never get into the disconnected pore space. And so this thing starts collapsing toward a straight line again because it's acting like a single domain, but the disconnected pore space almost doesn't exist. And so there's a couple of different um, scenarios here, but it allows us to sort of constrain how quickly mass is moving back and forth if we have the geophysical data, which normally we, we hydrogeologists don't think about collecting. So... We did this in aquifer systems, and we thought, well, we should be able to do the same things in stream systems. Well, now the only difference is, is my connected pore space is a stream, and my disconnected pore space is the hyperreic zone. Um, and so what we ended up doing was collecting electrical data in stream systems as well. One of the things that um, we had to do um, for these stream systems, though, is we actually had to reconstruct models of the subsurface electrical resistivity. We didn't have to do this in the aquifer systems because the mobile and the immobile porosities overlapped each other. They were in the same, same location. Here, they're separated from each other. The stream is a separate entity from the rest of the aquifer. So we have to reconstruct some images. So the way that it works with electrical imaging, and for those of you that think about inverse models, this is a, just a primer with a different, a different method. The idea is that you are going to collect a certain amount of data in the field. Each one of those black dots is a driven current and a measured potential and an estimated apparent resistivity. This is how data were plotted back in 1950, before we had fancy computers for inversion. People would just plot the data in some way, contour between it, and sort of try to estimate what was down there. The reason that the dots are all over the place in space, what you have here is uh, distance and depth 
is that the farther apart your electrodes are from each other, the bigger uh, part of the subsurface that's being averaged, and the deeper that point is being assigned. Now, it's kind of stupid to assign it to a point because this is a volumetric measurement. You know, it's like flow. It's just going wherever it wants. But this is, this is sort of the state of the practice circa 1940, and it's never really changed. Um, and so um, what you're seeing here is a, is a bunch of data points. And the idea is you have data from the field, and then you try to make a model that simulates your data such that these two things match. And when they match, you say, well, that's a possible model that at least describes what's happening in the subsurface. And so down here, what I'm showing you is a reconstructed model of the electrical resistivity of the subsurface and uh, such that the, the data that would be simulated by it look like what I see in the field, so that those two things should look similar to each other. It doesn't mean that this model is right by any stretch. Like all inverse problems, this is a highly uncertain process, and this is one model that describes what's happening down there. So what happens then is that, now I'm showing this to you in a borehole sense, is that you have this reconstructed map of the electrical resistivity, and you'd use Archie's law, that relationship we talked about a second ago, the straight line relationship, and you would estimate the salinity then. So if you were interested in how uh, the salinity of the subsurface is changing, you would just take that bulk conductivity and change it over to a fluid conductivity. The problem with re image reconstruction, and for those of you that work on this, you know this is a common problem, is that the truth that's down there doesn't always look like what comes out of our models. And that's because there are a lot of assumptions that go into the inverse procedure. And geophysicists are really um, greedy about inversion compared to hydrogeologists. Um, the way hydrogeologists think about the inverse problem, they might be interested in subsurface permeability. So they'll measure the hydraulic head or the pressures at a bunch of different locations, and then they'll take their aquifer and say, let's break the earth into three layers. So I want to know what the permeability is of these three layers, and now I have 50 measurements of pressure in order to estimate these three parameters. What geophysicists tend to do is we collect hundreds or thousands of measurements, and then we break the subsurface into thousands or tens of thousands of parameters. And you know, if you flash back to linear algebra, if you have 10,000 unknowns and only 1,000 equations, you've got a problem, right? And so what geophysicists do is they often make some assumptions about what the model should look like. And often in electrical geophysics, they just sm smear it out. They smooth everything out. And so what that means is that your subsequent image of what's really happening is like the beer goggles version of what's in the subsurface. Right? It's too smooth. And so what that means is that, again, here's an image on the left-hand side of the true subsurface and what would be reconstructed from an electrical model. Electrical geophysics is much worse than seismic or radar or wave-based methods that you guys might be familiar with. The resolution just isn't as, as good. The sensitivity is really poor. The diffusion-based physics rather than wave-based physics. Um, but the reconstruction process is also plagued by the fact that um, we have too many unknowns for the number of data that we have. So... Um, so we'll take these, these images with a grain of salt. Now, the way that these, um, these reconstructed models work is that you're going to have an objective function. And let's just look at the yellow part of the, the box for a second. Um, what that says is that I'm going to measure resistances. R is my resistance. And I have true ones from the field. What I would like is ultimately my modeled resistances, like we talked about a second ago in the, the schematic. If those two things are similar, then that's good. This is a minimization problem. I'd like that thing to be, to be near zero where my model data look like my field data. And there's some weights on that based on how accurate our measurements actually are. This red term is what makes things too smooth. And so what's happening there is because we have too many unknowns for the number of data we have, we throw in another piece to the objective function. And we say, well, let's make the model look like something. And what this thing is doing right here is that this, this W2 is acting on the model itself. This is the model of the conductivity. What W2 is, is it's a, it's a roughener. And uh, it's actually just a first or a second derivative. You think about what a derivative does, is it roughens something up. But if it's within a minimization problem, you're minimizing the roughness of something. So what's happening is you're making a smooth model, is what these equations do, that mostly fits your data. The, the outcome of this is that for things that have sharp boundaries, for instance, like this synthetic model here, this is what you get back. So that's just so that you understand that when I show you these data here that they're they're only so good. The resolution is also variable in space, and it turns out that for electrical methods, diffusion-based physics, unlike wave-based physics like seismic and radar, um, your sensitivity is highest near where you're driving current. In seismic, your resolution is highest where you have the most number of intersecting rays. So if you think about a borehole um, to, you know, seismic tomography experiment, your resolution is actually highest in the center of the plane. For electrical, it's highest near the boreholes. So um, what we're going to do is, um, you know, we, we did a comparison site. I told you a second ago that at the very beginning of the talk that we were interested in how streams exchange, if they're really steep or if they're really shallow. Um, and we took two sites 
one that was really steep and one that was really shallow. And I'm just going to show you the steep site in the interest of time today. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about a, a sort of a famous field site in Oregon for stream hydrologists known as the H.J. Andrews. And um, in the H.J. Andrews, we also worked in a couple of watersheds, and I'm just going to focus on one of those today, too. So um, what we're going to look at is uh, a stream that's fairly steep. Uh, it's got about a 12% grade. So um, against all sort of flow convention, um, I have flow going up and to the left on this diagram. And, um, and what this is, is this is the watershed that we're working in. As you can see, I work on pretty small scales compared to the things that you guys probably think about most of the time. And, you know, hydrology is a sort of a regional scale process most of the time. And so we're thinking about things on sort of the tens of meters scale. When we're getting really big, we might go to the kilometer scale. Um, but what we have here is a system where we're looking at a stream. And uh, part of the reason we wanted to work at the site is there were already a lot of data. All of the little red circles that you can kind of see scattered within there are wells that had already been drilled within this watershed. And all of the sort of little yellow crosses are us. They're electrodes that we put in for the geophysics. What we did is we dumped a salt tracer down here, about 100 meters away, allowed it to mix within the stream, and then it migrates down through the system. And we're going to image and try to see where that tracer goes as we, um, as we collect those data. So there are a couple things I want to point out, one of which is I just made a red circle show up. There's a boulder there. And so in this map that we have drawn, we have a bunch of the big boulders labeled. And this doesn't look like any particularly special boulder, but it turns out that it shows up in our data. So I'm going to show it to you as sort of a gut check um, when you start looking at the reconstructed images. I'm going to show you five of the six geophysical lines. I'm not going to show you one of them because I could never get it to invert. Uh, we had all sorts of uh, data error problems on that line, and I think it's because if you take a look at the electrodes on that line, a whole bunch of them are on rock. It turns out it's really hard to drive current into rock. And so, um, we were just not really able to make that happen. I worked for the USGS for a number of years, and um, we would work with these sorts of techniques, and we were trying to find ways to actually in inject current or make electrodes that would allow you to get current into rock. And um, we were using saturated baby diapers for a long time, and so some of the best electrodes we had, we did not use that here. And so anyway, you have five, five uh, rows of, of data. I'm showing you a flashing line right now, and I'm going to focus on that line a little bit as I start to introduce these data, and that's because it's sort of at an interesting place between a really steep, narrow valley and a wide, flatter valley. And I was telling you a second ago, we were kind of interested in exchange characteristics between the two. So I'm going to use a single watershed as an example of both. So what we did is we went out uh, in 2010, and we did four experiments. And so what this is a map of is, is stream discharge, which is often called big Q in, hyd in hydrology through time. And what you see is that the stream itself in sort of May, June, there's rainfall still happening within uh, this part of Oregon. And then sort of in mid-June, the rain stops, Mediterranean-type climate, it dries out, and the stream discharge drops as a, as a function of that. So what we did is we did four salt injections during that time at four different rates. These are on liters per second. And just to give you a sense of how small that is, um, you know, we think about like Boulder Creek, for instance. And you know, I don't even actually know what Boulder Creek's running at right now, but uh, Clear Creek and Golden is running, I don't know, 800 CFS cubic feet per second right now. Um, these numbers are a fraction of a cubic foot per second. So this is small, small. And that's why I'm using liters per second, is they're so tiny. This goes from being sort of a thigh deep stream to an ankle deep stream over that time. One point about why small streams, um, which is that when you think about that hyperreic zone, that, that river's liver, when you think about just a surface area volume problem, you've got a lot more surface area to the size of a small stream than you do to a big stream. So when we think about in-stream processing and of contaminants, um, the Mississippi doesn't do a great job because the hyperreic zone is so small compared to the amount of water flowing through. 90% of the processing that we think about um, is happening in these, these small streams here in the United States and, and in the world. Actually, the United States is not special. Our streams are just like every other stream. Um, so what I'm showing you here are um, three of those four data sets. I'm not showing you the one from 15 liters per second just because we had a pump problem and injected a little too much mass. And while it doesn't matter from a quantitative point of view, since we're just looking at pictures, it's a little distracting, so I just pulled those data out. Um, what I'm showing you are reconstructed electrical images of these tracer tests. And uh, we did a 48-hour injection. And what you see at all three of these different flow rates is the stream highlighted in sort of a bluish color. What this is is the percent change in the bulk electrical conductivity from the background case. So we're injecting salt, and surprise, surprise, the stream lights up. Right? And so that's, that's all that's happening here right now. If you take a look at depth and distance, these are small, sort of 13 by 5 meters. Right? So a little, little. So um, what you're going to see is that as we move through this tracer test, 
six hours in, 12 hours in, 24 hours in, 48 hours in, you always see the stream in blue, right? It's really electrically conductive. The change is significant. What's cool, though, is that you also see other parts around the stream that are lighting up, too. So what's happening there is we're actually imaging the hyperreact zone. And this is the first time that anyone had ever done this. And so if we wanted to know where stuff was being processed, we could see that in these images in a way that we hadn't been able to do before. Um, and then we turn the tracer off. And six hours later, after the tracer had been turned off, you'll notice that the stream itself is starting to clean up already. And in fact, at the high flow case, it's almost back to its background right away. And then 24 hours later, most of the salt is gone. One of the things that's interesting here, though, is that um, you'll notice that there is still mass left in the aquifer after the tracer test. That hyperreic zone is holding on. There's long, longer residence times um, holding on to some of that salt. And it leaves like a bathtub ring around the stream itself, in this case. And it takes it a little bit longer for that material to be processed, to, to move its way back into the stream and then out of the system. The other thing that's interesting is we had some hypotheses about how uh, wide the hyperreic zone would be with season. And it turned out that we were absolutely wrong about what we thought. And I show this as an example of, of hypothesis testing because it's a great example of one that is false. We had this idea that, if you remember at the beginning, that in the early times when there's lots of water, that the hyperreic zone would be more compressed. Well, we don't see that at all. We see a much bigger hyperreic zone here in uh, the um, high base flow conditions than we do in the low. And I think that's because we didn't think too much about how the stream would be pushing back on the aquifer, too. Uh, there's also a, a dimensionality problem here. In 2D, this makes a lot of sense. But in 3D, we've got flow paths coming from all over the place. So um, no geophysical talk is complete without 3D cutaway isosurface plots. So here is a, um, an image of the five transects in which we collected 2D electrical data. You'll see the missing line there at 15 meters. Flow is now going the correct direction, which is from left to right, top to bottom. And what I'm going to do is show you um, for the seven liter per second case, so one of the smaller flow cases, what happens when we inject a tracer. Notice that already, I'm showing you here one hour in, you see the little red dot here, like Bill Cosby style, going to go through this tracer test. You'll notice that, strangely, one hour into this tracer injection, and the injection is happening way up there, it seems to show up at the bottom of my, my system first. Right? So as I move through time, in that flat, wider valley, deep, narrow valleys up there, you see this tracer sort of come through, light up the stream, and then sort of disappear. Right? What's interesting about this is that we get that Z dimension here, too. It's hard to see with isosurface plots. Geophysicists love them anyway, but I'm going backwards in time now. Um, but you can see sort of depth and distance of where that tracer moves. This thing is electrically conductive. The geophysics is picking that up. One of the things that's happening at the very bottom here is there's a huge fallen log that seems to be back, uh, backlogging some of that tracer, and you can see that in this image here. All right, so what we did with these data is we decided what we're really interested in is how these tracers move. And so um, we calculated some temporal moments. And the nice thing about temporal moments is that they're easy mathematics. They're ways of, of when you have a spill of methyl ethyl bad stuff in the subsurface, what people want to know is where is it going to go, how much mass is there, how big is the plume. Temporal moments are a way of, of characterizing those things. The first three moments, so if I have a concentration breakthrough curve like this one here, if I want to know how much mass is passing by my area, it's just the area under the curve. If I want to know the arrival time, well, then it's just that, that white line there. If I want to know how fat that, that plume is, I can estimate that from the, the black lines. The nice thing about temporal moments is the only thing I need in order to estimate things like tracer mass and the mean arrival time is the concentration with time. And so I've got a whole map now from the geophysics of conductivities with time, which are proxies for concentration with time. And so now I can say something about all of these things in a distributed sense. So um, here is uh, those same data now being converted to a mean arrival time. One of the things you'll notice is, um, so things that arrive quickly are darker colored. You'll notice that down here in the flat, wider valley, you see things showing up sort of at 24 hours, which would make sense for a 48-hour test. That would sort of be the mean arrival time. But we see something completely different at the top. The top, we've got numbers sort of all over the place. But at the bottom of the aquifer, it sort of makes sense. We see the stream. We see the area around the stream. So it, what turns out to be happening is that we do a pretty good job of seeing what's happening in that flat, wider valley. And we do a terrible job of imaging what's happening at the steep, narrow valley. And we even saw that in the isosurfaces a little bit, the fact that it looked like the tracer showed up at the bottom part of the watershed first. I think what we have here is a resolution issue, which is that in that flat, wider valley, the geophysics is doing a much better job of imaging where the tracer goes. 
than when it's really steep and narrow. The geophysics is just having a hard time imaging this really small stream and the uh, concentration within it. And so we don't do a good job in the upper part of the aquifer. So um, what we have here is those five transects and, um, and for the four different injection cases here. And uh, what we do is we make a plot of mean arrival times within this, this aquifer system. What's nice about this is that usually we can only get these data from the stream, but now what we're able to do is get a much more distributed images, image of what's happening in the subsurface. Some of them look kind of garbagey, um, as is the case sometimes with geophysical data, um, and some of them are, are, are gorgeous, but these are data that we wouldn't normally otherwise have. What we do notice, though, is if you just look at transect two and you look at it through, through the season from left to right, we see that the mean arrival time of the tracer is later as we go later and later in the season while the stream is moving more slowly. So that's not a huge surprise. We are able to see the flow paths in which these things move. The next temporal moment is about the spread, how spread out that plume is. And, um, and I feel like the story isn't actually terribly interesting and that you see sort of the same spread the whole way through. And in fact, if we look at the data here in that cross-sectional view instead, again, these five transects with the four experiments, you don't see a whole big change in how spread out our plumes get with time. They move faster or slower, but they spread out about the same. And, uh, and we still see flow paths that we wouldn't otherwise be able to image. The one thing that I think is actually kind of cool is the, the third moment, which has to do with the skew of the curve, how non-Gaussian the curve is. The non-Gaussian part describes the transient storage. And so that's part of the reason this is interesting. What's showing you here is that the, the values that are closer to white have longer tails within them. So stuff is sticking around for much longer than it should. So you see all these bathtub rings. You see where stuff is being stored within the aquifer in that yellow and white zone. The other thing you see is sort of up here in the second transect, there's a big black hole. And that's that boulder that I pointed out to you before. You actually see the tracer migrating around that boulder. There's no, there's no storage at all that's happening in that particular area. So again, we do a really good job of, of imaging the hyperreic zone here where the resolution is good enough. And we do a less good job in the upper part of the aquifer. There's that boulder. All right, so a couple questions about um, the hypotheses that we put forward. Well, we found out that we do have a larger hyperreic zone early in the season, which goes counter to the hypothesis that we put forward. And we think that's just because the flow rate of the stream itself is actually confounding sort of a simple water table control. The other thing that we found is that the electrical resistivity tool um, can image tracers, but only where the resolution is good. So in the flat, wider valleys, we do a really good job of imaging tracer. But in these really steep, confined, small streams, we have a hard time of imaging what's happening. So at the end of this, what I think was really cool about this work is that these electrical data were allow allowing us to say something about this river's liver, this hyperreic process, in a way that we normally wouldn't have access that we are doing more than just dumping dye into the stream, that we can actually image what's, ha what's happening down there and say something about the amount of time it takes for these solutes to move. Um, what's new about the work that we've done here is that um, this was the first time that people were able to sort of image flow paths in 2 and 3D. Um, I think there's a huge place for geophysics within hydrology um, that's, that's still very underutilized. Um, every, seismic is perhaps one of the most valuable geophysical tools that hydrogeologists don't use. Um, and the other thing we were able to do is through these temporal moments was say something about what transport processes were actually happening when advection was happening versus diffusion versus this transient storage piece. So with that, that's it. And I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thanks. In this case, yeah, the tiny, tiny. So we were looking at little, little streams. And so um, we have definitely uh, worked. So I'm doing some work in like the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory here. You know, and there we're looking down sort of 40, 50 meters. But that's, that's pretty deep for, uh, for us in terms of um, hydrogeologists. A lot of the sort of critical zone, the part of the, the aquifer that people are interested in is usually that top sort of 100 meters. Here it's tiny, tiny, 10 meters. So. That large boulder, do you think it was compacting your pore space and that's why it was showing up, uh, flowing around it? I think that's exactly right. It just, it basically, all the, you know, all of the tracer that had ended up in that stream just migrated right around that boulder. And it just happened to be on the line that we were imaging. So you see that boulder much more clearly than some of the other ones. Um, the only reason I pointed it out is just that it's one of those features that you can see quickly and easily and have a sense that the geophysics is doing something that is, is more meaningful than you'd otherwise have. 
one of the reasons you selected that stream in Oregon is it had these pre-drilled uh, wells. Yeah. Did you use any of the data from those? Yeah, I have a boat ton of data from there. Yeah, and so I, I didn't show it. But um, one of the things we looked at within those wells is not only the electrical conductivity of the tracer going by, but we measured the hydraulic head um, through that entire period from May to August. And so one of the things we were interested in was how the gradients were changing seasonally and with events. And so if you have a big rainfall, you know, how, do the, how does the water table shift? In this particular watershed, maybe this isn't surprising, um, in sort of a steeper you know, watershed like this, the, um, the flow basically goes under the stream and down gradient all season. And so we didn't see huge changes even in the flatter part in terms of the hydraulic gradient um, at that particular site. So we do have a lot of um, uh, in-well data that sort of help to tell the story that is sort of in the background here that I didn't show. And you said that you used a salt as a tracer. Have you ever tried any other kind of tracer, like a metal? You know, so um, I personally haven't. Um, so I've used salt. Um, and when I say salt, I really mean like Morton table salt. It's, you know, sodium chloride, super cheap. Um, and part of the reason we use it is because it's super cheap. Um, when I was working for the USGS, I had um, colleagues that got permission to inject a, a lead arsenic chromium tracer into a watershed. Um, you can imagine that the, uh, the permissions associated with that are a little bit more difficult. Even salt is, you know, for those of you that have an ecology bent, um, you know, that even getting permission for salt sometimes is hard because of the ecological impacts. But um, there are people that have injected metals and watched uptake of metals. Uh, it takes a particular system to allow you to do that. that was a military base, so it was already had some specialness happening. Um, part of the problem with injecting Metals um, for this kind of thing is that the, we may not see a significant change in electrical conductivity, and so we're trying to use tracers that have strong electrical contrast so that we can actually see them. So if we used something else, um, we just have to think about what the contrast would look like so that we could see it. This is just cheap, you know, relatively okay to get permissions with, but you, you, could, do, you could do some other interesting tracers if you could get permission. Thanks for having me.